Hello everyone and welcome to episode 9 of CCLG's Research Talks for Parents and Public. I'm Ellie Ellicott and my job is to share research with our supporters. So um, let's start with some housekeeping. We will be holding our Q&A session at the end of the talk, so please do submit your questions whenever you think of one using the Q&A button that's down at the bottom of your screen. Um, if you do like to use the chat function, make sure you set the to drop down to everyone or people may not be able to see your message. Um, the webinar is being recorded and will be available publicly on our YouTube channel, so I will send out a link when it is ready for you. Um, this month's talk is called How Biobanking Supports Childhood Cancer Research and is being led by Dr. John Moffat. John is a consultant specialising in leukaemia and is the Associate Director of the Vivo Biobank. Vivo Biobank is the UK's leading resource for the storage of childhood cancer samples and data. Their samples can be used in research projects across the world to create a brighter future for children with cancer. So without any further ado, I'm going to hand over to John. Great. Thanks, Ellie. Um, hi, everybody. And thanks for your sharing part of your evening with us, with me. Uh, so I'll just share my screen. Hope that'll work like it did in test before. So let's just pick that and hopefully you will see this. So hopefully everybody can see a title slide. Uh, if anybody can't, please shout now. So, yeah, that's what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to spend about half an hour talking about this and then plenty of time for questions. So, um, let's start with, just in case, a definition of what biobanking is. So, uh, an online dictionary said a biobank is a large collection of biological and medical data and tissue samples amassed for research purposes. I thought this was interesting. Um, the World Economic Forum uh, 2023 uh, said this just this year, uh, the more well-characterized high quality samples are available through biobanks, the faster research will advance an impact upon the faster delivery of precision healthcare today as part of SDG3. SDG3 is the Sustainable Development Goals of the World Economic Forum. So they think that biobanking is important um, and that's what a biobank is. Uh, and we at Vivo Biobank have a mission statement. Um, I should warn you that we've got a formal legal title that's a bit longer uh, called the UK Children's and Young Persons Cancer CYP Biobank, um, which aims to be a world-class biorepository for samples and data collected from children and young people with cancer, which aims to underpin research into advances in the causes, prevention and diagnosis of cancer. So I could stop there, um, but the idea of today is to flesh out a little bit more essentially what that means in practice. So, uh, slightly complicated slide. So let's start at the top left. Um, Viva Biobank was formed uh, a couple of years ago now um, by the merger of two separate biobanks, um, the Children's and Leukemia Cancer CCLG, sorry, I can't say that properly, uh, Tissue Bank, established in 1998, and Cell Bank, uh, which is a leukemia cell bank established in 2003. Um, the Tissue Bank was funded by CCLG and Cell Bank by Blood Cancer UK. And they came together and agreed to fund us as a joint bank, which is now renamed the Vivo Biobank. And because uh, the CCLG Tissue Bank started 25 years ago now, uh, this is our 25th anniversary year. So we've been very gratefully funded by CRUK and BCUK, um, and we partner closely with CCLG still in various activities. Um, we now have uh, samples on over 20,000 children, young people uh, who've had or have cancer, um, and that equates to over 200,000 actual samples. Um, we've supported uh, getting on for 300 re separate research projects uh, and banking from all 23 children's cancer hospitals and some additional uh, TYA hospitals around the country as well. Uh, on the left hand side, you can see broadly just geographically how it works. The purple dots are the, our kind of core banking sites. Um, the bank infrastructure is based in three places, really. Um, the University of Newcastle, uh, where some staff are based and the Solid Tumor Biobank is the University of York, where um, staff are based, and a lot of the and the, a lot of the data now is in York, and then 
a lot of our liquid, most of our liquid samples are actually in UK Biocenter, which is a really massive biobank, and we subcontract space from them to store liquid samples. We also work closely with clinical trials units. You can see them around the on there on the map in green. So just to show you very briefly, this is a little detailed, but this is what we hold at the minute um, in terms of samples. Um, so you can see that the single commonest disease is acute lymphoblastic leukemia, which is not quite, but nearly half of the samples we hold. Um, that's slightly biased in favor of ALL compared to the actual population frequency of this. That's because we collect lots of different samples in ALL and also because leukemias are easier diseases to get samples off with just a blood draw or a bone marrow aspirate. Otherwise, the samples we hold broadly represent the distribution of diseases uh, that we see in children and young adults. Uh, so we've got a, a good broad spread of lots of diseases. Ooh, it's frozen. That's not good. Apologies while I try to get this to move. There we go. Right. Um, how do we uh, work? Well, the process starts with consent. We approach uh, families and young people, uh, generally in the first few days of their treatment, not directly at the beginning of treatment, where often, quite rightly, their, their thoughts and minds are focused on the care of their child or themselves and the process they're going through in terms of diagnosis but as soon as is appropriate after that we approach families uh, and give them information and then which is age appropriate and set up to be read by all kinds of people and then we hopefully gain consent which we do the vast majority of families and the young patients uh, agree to provide samples for us and that is the first step then we collect samples. This is a little different between liquid and what we call solid tumours. Uh, essentially for liquid tumours read leukaemia um, and solid tumours all the others. Uh, reasons will become obvious but basically in the leukaemias uh, we collect um, samples of bone marrow from patients because uh, a bone marrow is a very routine part of the diagnosis, diagnostic workup of a leukaemia patient. We collect some peripheral blood at the same time and all leukemia patients have lumbar punctures to test to see if they've got disease in their CSF. And so we collect some of that as well. And that gets sent to Biobank. We're also going to be collecting this fancy stuff here. Uh, it's just peripheral blood. This fancy streck tube is for some novel stuff I'll come back to uh, later in the talk. Um, we collect those samples. We also collect uh, samples from labs. So samples that get sent off for routine uh, clinical tests. If there's spare samples there and we've got consent, they come to us. Um, we do do a process in leukemia where we actually quarantine some samples here in case critical samples for clinical uh, testing are needed. So basically, occasionally samples from the MRD labs, who essentially their job is to measure leukemia response. Occasionally, they need our samples because they didn't get enough from the clinicians. And so we quarantine a little bit uh, for them until they don't need it. And then we keep that for research if that's approved. Uh, yeah, that's what we do. And then samples go off to researchers, which I'll explain more about in due course. The, these samples get to us very simply by being posted in a uh, safe box through the post and they get barcoded and shipped off, which we do an awful lot. And that happens kind of like every day of the week. The solids are a little bit different. Um, we collect a tumor sample, uh, both fresh sample, fresh frozen samples, and this fancy stuff called FFPE, uh, which stands for fi formalin fixed paraffin embedded. What essentially, just to explain how uh, medicine works a little bit, when a pathologist looks at a any kind of lump of tissue down a microscope, before they can do so, if they just take it out of the patient to look at it, it's too squidgy and it, you can't look at it properly. So what they do is they fix it in formalin so it doesn't go off and go moldy. And then they put it in paraffin so they can cut it to really thin slices. So that's what FFPE means. It means the standard tissue that is collected in histopath labs around the country. Those are not sent straight away to us. They're stored locally at site. Uh, what the sites do is they register the patient on paper so that the we know about them and then annually uh, to save shipping costs uh, and hassle for everybody, samples are transferred to Newcastle. 
So what this looks like is this, is that uh, at the local sites, liquid samples are sent by post to Biocenter, who process the samples into what we need, which I'll come to in a minute. Meanwhile, uh, on the solid side, frozen samples and paraffin, uh, frozen samples come to the biobank on an annual basis, and then the paraffin samples are actually kept on site until requested by researchers, and then we do the process of collecting them for them. So how does it work with liquid samples is when they've arrived at Biocenter, essentially they spin the spin them down and separate the blood or the bone marrow into its constituent parts. Uh, so the liquid phase, which is called plasma, then you get a lot of red cells at the bottom and you get all the exciting white cells in the middle. And um, we then take those white, we take the plasma, we store the white cells, we store everything. And we particularly take the white cells and we separate it into its constituent parts, which are useful for research. And they're frozen at Biocenter until needed. Um, at the same time, we collect information because one of the core parts of uh, delivering useful research here is that a sample by itself is only of so much use. You need to know not exactly who it came from, but the kind of patient it came from, the kind of disease they had, uh, all the other clinical factors that we find important. You know, was this a was this an easy one to treat? Was this a more difficult one to treat? How did the treatment go? Because that's where researchers can learn um, and teach us things about disease. So um, anyway, we store lots of information about the sample, what it's been consented for, when that was done. Um, we do everything very thoroughly. Um, what was taken, what we've got. And we run, maintain a big database um, for researchers to know what we've got, along with clinical information, which is useful for them. So just to share with anything a little bit, uh, what our actual real, real situation is now. So this is just the snapshot of about the last year. Um, you won't be surprised to know that we have to uh, go to our funders every year to justify our money to, to say we, what a good job we're doing or otherwise. And this is what we collected in the last year. This is across our sites. And you can see there's a bit of variation um, and things aren't perfect. And there are some sites because of resource issues locally that are not currently able to provide samples for us and other sites that are doing very well. Um, some of the sites are very small on this though. It's not an equal, it shouldn't be an equal line. Some places are very small, some see lots of patients. And on the liquid side, it's a bit more of an even distribution, um, but again, some places are struggling, some places are doing great. Um, right, so once we've got samples in and we've got appropriate consent for those samples, um, that's only so much use. There's no use just collecting these samples and keeping them in a nice box and looking at them. We need to use them. So how does that happen? So the first thing is that, well, we advertise our services around the research world uh, a lot. And then researchers contact us and making essentially generally an informal inquiry as to whether we've got the kind of samples that they might want for their research. And uh, our team do a database research, a search, and we can tell them what we've got and then they go away and say, is that useful? And generally they then go, yes, that's great. Um, and then they submit a formal application. Um, and in that application, they justify the research, they would justify it scientifically, um, they justify it ethically, they provide evidence that they've got the money, um, that they've talked to parent and patient representatives about it. Uh, and we then review it um, partly internally, but with the help of external reviewers uh, where required. Sometimes the research has come to us with external review done already, but sometimes it doesn't and we, we obtain that. Uh, again, PPI review occurs at that stage. And we review to make sure that basically the research is good, that it's gonna answer a sensible question. Uh, that, yeah, that the question was useful and that the team can answer that question. It's good use of the samples that we've got. Um, we then, if that's approved and the vast majority of, of requests are approved, but not all. Um, we then sort out the legal stuff and arrange to ship the samples to the researcher. So um, before I go on to explain what the researchers do, just in case, a tiny bit of uh, molecular biology to explain how things work. Inside a cell, there's something called the nucleus, and inside the nucleus is this material called DNA. And DNA uh, essentially contains the program that tells a cell how to work. If a cell has become cancerous, almost exclusively, that will be because there's a mistake in the DNA somewhere. 
uh, that is causing that cancer. So that can be a very useful material to look at. DNA is then turned by the cell into something called RNA. And RNA is essentially the messenger and the process whereby the cell converts that DNA data into proteins and proteins are what do things proteins do obvious things like form the structure of cells but they also form all the enzymes and things that make a cell do what it does so proteins essentially determine how a cells behave so all three of those can be very useful things to study and that is what the samples that we get from the patient are broken down into and we store them essentially as dna rna and what are cells which the which researchers can extract protein from so what do researchers do with our samples? Well, lots of things uh, is the short answer. Uh, they use DNA sometimes to study uh, genetic changes in cancer cells. That can be changes that might have led to the cancer occurring in the first place. So these are kind of studies looking at prevention. Why did the genetic change happen in the first place? How, what can we do to stop that happening in the future? Or genetic changes that affect uh, prognosis. We have lots of markers genetically that tell us how a patient might respond to treatment. So they track those kind of things. They also study the RNA and the proteins, which to study how those cells work and behave and to kind of identify features that make those cancer cells able or less able to survive in certain conditions and that kind of thing. Um, quite often, if available, and this is much easier in, in my world of leukemia than in solid tumors, but not impossible in solid tumors, uh, researchers use live cells growing in the lab to test how those cells work. They can then uh, essentially edit those cells, fiddle with those cells to either try to correct genetic mistakes, see if that stops the cell becoming cancerous or do other things to it, all to learn exactly how the cancer behaves um, to get at the mechanisms that are behind the cancer and ultimately to identify new targets that we can identify new drugs or even old purpose, repurpose old drugs in order to kill cancer cells to develop better treatments for the patients. Um, we also study uh, the behavior of human cancer cells in artificial models. These might be um, fancy things that we call organoids, which are essentially in laboratory sort of models of, for example, a kidney or a bit of brain to try to kind of study how the cells behave in a, rather than just by themselves in the kind of environment they live in. Or we do use, and researchers use animal mouse models, which is particularly the most common thing is a what we call a PDX, a patient-derived xenograft. I'm going to come back to those in a minute. Um, here, I've literally just cut um, three papers off of the on our on our web page. If you're interested, there's a whole list of the current research projects and the publications that they've produced, and these are just spread out from some of the few in the last. Uh, in the last six months, really, um, they're on the list. And you can see we cover all kinds of diseases. Now, the titles here might be utterly mystifying to you, but basically we look at uh, we look at brain tumours, there's a look at um, other tumours uh, in the brain or not in the brain, uh, research on leukaemia. We cover all kinds of tumours and all kinds of diseases and all kinds of elements of research. Um, in looking at our... <clears throat> funding, I did quite a lot of work on this, looking at our funding application a couple of years ago. In the leukemia world, which I know better than the solid tumor world, it is really hard, honestly, to find research done in the UK that involves, <clears throat> you know, um, the, involves the use of samples in any shape or form that does not involve Vivo Biobank. So essentially, we support pretty much all, I don't want to overstate the case, but pretty much all uh, biological-based research occurring in the UK and broader than, not, we don't support all of it around the world, but in the UK we support pretty much all of it uh, and quite a lot of our samples go to other research groups around the world. So we do support an awful lot of the research that happens in the UK in childhood and young people's cancer. Um, now, I want to touch on one topic which might sometimes be seen as controversial uh, and that's the value of these PDX models. So to briefly explain what they are. Um, we start with mice. These are specially bred mice, which are, it's a bit complicated, but at the most basic level, they're immune deficient. If you take a, a normal mouse and you put human cells in it, that mouse has got an immune system and that mouse is going to 
kill uh, anything that's foreign, just like we would kill any foreign tissue that's attached to us, which we're in my world of uh, leukemia, where we have to do bone marrow transplant, we have to do all kinds of chemotherapy to get somebody else's tissue into a patient. Well, the same is true, in a, it would be same to true in a mouse, but in mice, you can breed them to be immune deficient so that they tolerate having human cells in their body. And generally you inject those cells. In this example diagram, it's into the bone, but normally it doesn't actually need to be into bone. It can just be into the tail vein. Um, and then the cancer cells proceed to grow. Uh, sometimes they're put under the skin if it's a solid tumor. Exact method depends on the tumor you're studying. The cells grow in the mouse and then you could do lots of things to study them. You can either uh, fiddle with the cancer cells before you put them in to see if that affects their behavior. In a mouse, as in has your genetic change you've instituted affect its behavior and is that a useful target to help understand the, uh, the, the cancer? Or you can put them in and then you can give the chemotherapeutic drugs or the target drug that you're developing to the mouse and see if it kills the cancer cells in vitro. And that's what's been done here in this particular study. It's a very useful model. Um, we could learn lots of things. Um, you can learn a lot that you can't learn in a lab. Uh, so one of the key things we know is that cells talk to each other and that their environment is really important. And cells behave very differently in a dish by themselves to what they do in a more normal environment and how they talk to each other. So, you know, just in my world, there's very definite evidence that uh, leukemia cells could be protected by the cells around them. And if you study them without those cells around them, they look like they die with the treatment that you might use. But when you put them in their environment with those cells around them, you find that the drug doesn't work. So you have to, to get the best knowledge, study those cells in as natural environment as possible. And that is most, uh, well, the mouse model is a really good way to try to do that. Um, and you can also give treatments that you can, can to a mouse that you can't just throw into a human without understanding how it affects humans. And you at least learn something from a mouse model before you start exposing humans to the drug and know that it does what it should in principle to the cancer cells before you then start thinking about effects it may have on humans. The other uh, use of PDX models, which is not the primary use of them, but this is also very useful. Um, children are often very small and tumour biopsies are often really, really small um, in difficult to get out tumours. And often cancer cells grow quite well in a mouse and you can then expand the cells and that simply enables you to do many more studies on that tumour than you otherwise could do if you had to use what's really a tiny sample um, all by itself. So there may be questions on this later, and I appreciate that animal research can be uh, controversial, but we do find it, re well, we, the researchers find it really, really useful. Often a lots of developments have been made through this kind of process. Um, I want to touch on now, just before we finish, um, a little bit more about where we're heading. So at the minute, we have lots and lots of samples from lots and lots of patients. And if you look on this map, we have what we call clinical annotation. So we know some things about the patient, what disease they had, um, how old they were, that kind of stuff um, to tell researchers. Um, but we want to make this much better. Um, so, and it's all on this map. So for example, we're gonna, we, are, we do this to some degree, we're going to improve our work on this, collecting all the data from the laboratories have looked at the samples. So all the stuff that's done in the NHS on those samples, gather all that data, anonymized, but um, put into our database so that we know and can tell researchers everything that the NHS pathologists know about that particular sample. You may have heard of uh, Genomics England. I hope you've heard of Genomics England. They advertise themselves very well. Um, they obviously run a, a process called whole genome sequencing on patients who consent for that. And they hold so they hold whole genome sequencing data and we have a full intention to join their data to our data so that researchers going into Genomics England, which they do through these things called GSIPs, um, they can do their research on the data that Genomics England hold. But if they then want to validate their findings on actual samples, they can come to us and say, can we have the samples on these this data that we've looked at? And vice versa, that researchers who want to study samples that we hold can then save themselves time, save money, save duplication, and learn more by getting the whole genome data from Genomics England. 
A very similar stuff is true from a trial that has been running called SMPEDS, which looks at children with relapsed tumours. And that's going into something that's called Knowledge Hub at the minute. And we're working with um, another group called ECMC to collect that data and to link that data to our uh, database. And indeed, to collect even better clinical data, again, anonymized about the patients so that researchers know more. We also uh, we collect samples on behalf of clinical trials already, and we're going to increase our links with those clinical trials so that what's happened to patients on clinical trials when they've been on them links to our samples. Um, Again, with permission, we have we have an in principle improvement of this approval of this to collect data from the NHS cancer registries that collect data on patients, and also the NHS clinical data sets which are collected uh, by the NHS. So, again, with permission, and over the next few years, we intend to build these links. And what that means is that when researchers come to us to get samples, they can know just as much as possible that is known about the patient and the disease that that patient had and how that disease did which really massively amplifies what can be learned by the researchers and then of course they produce their publications and the data there indeed goes to research data repository so that it can be reused so we've got a circular economy of maximal learning so that's our big vision our big intention going forward over the next couple of years um i just want to touch on this importantly uh which is where parents and patients are involved in the process and the answer is everywhere um, so we have a fairly multi-layered process of how we run the bank uh, so starting at the top we have a steering committee where those with a vested interest in what we do uh, we report to them and they see how we're doing so that's our funders and various other external bodies like genomics england and we have ppr representation at that level we also have a management committee that essentially run the bank on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of are we doing what we said we do is it going okay and we have ppi representation into that we have a, a really a kind of a group that meets every week to just basically discuss how things are going and make things happen and we've got um bethan uh, who i think is on the call who's get involved with that then we have the sample data and access committee that's this that's the group who through which researchers apply to get samples and we have ppi representation there um we have the operations group, which does the real practical uh, delivery of process, uh, and we have PPI involved there. And we have a PPI group who essentially joins all this up and help us with this massively. And they link in, in turn to the Pediatric Oncology Reference Team, Port, you may have heard of, some of you may be members, who help us massively with uh, trial documents and consent forms and paperwork and the parent paper parent face group groups etc et so ppi is a is a really important thing to us we've got quite a few people involved but there is always room for more people so bethan would say please if anybody else is interested in being involved here um please do get in touch it can be small it can be big it can be specific roles it can be general roles you can just be contacted for advice or you can get your kind of get teeth right into it so please just let us know um, I think that's the final thing I wanted to say, except to acknowledge um, everybody who's helped support this. So that starts with the research nurses, uh, the data managers, uh, the staff and the clinicians at the sites without whom we couldn't start this process. Uh, the pathologists and the scientists, on the, particularly on the solid side, who handle the specimens and get them to us. Um, the clinical trial unit people who help us with the data uh, and all that. And then, of course, the patients and the families who... Uh, donate the samples for whom without whom this would be an empty bank um ci uk and blood cancer uk who've funded us and cclg who've given us so much support in the past and continue to do so uh and then kind of our other collaborators at newcastle university uh university of bristol um york and biocenter who have essentially provide our functional structures and with that i will stop sharing for the moment and take any questions thank you all sorry i lost my unmute button <laughs> yeah that was really interesting to hear more about the um biobank um but we don't have any questions just yet so so could i give you one of mine <laughs> so i was just wondering if you could say a little bit about the ethics behind the use of pdf and if that's something that you um assess when people apply for the um, samples yeah 
okay so um this is uh so to be really clear as in our current form as vivo biobank um there's a specific question put to families and patients about whether they're happy for animal research to be performed on samples that they donate so so if they've donated samples they've either said yes or they've said no and we record that in our database and so if the answer is no then we know that those samples can't be released for pdx type work or and i can't think of an example but in principle something else that involved animals um uh, if they say yes, then of course those samples are, are free to go to that. There is there is other other layers of ethical regulation around PDX work. So the people that do that have to have licenses. They have to have an animal license from the Home Office to be able to look after the animals. They have to get local. Generally, they have to get local ethical uh, approval for the research as well. So essentially, any PDX work is going to go through at least two or three layers of approval before it happens if that makes sense yeah no I, they, I think it's reassuring to know that it's so regulated it's not just anyone can do what they want um if that makes <laughs> no. sense um so i have another question if that's okay um so what kind what areas are you looking to get more samples of and how do you have a plan to change that like i heard okay. there might be more tya samples needed yeah, okay. So I think there's a couple of areas there. Yeah, so one would be TYA. Um, so TYA, teenagers and adults, where um, there's a couple of factors that mean that we've got less than we would want to have. One of them is that, you know, TYA patients are treated in many more different places than children. So children pretty much all come to the 20 or so uh, pediatric primary treatment centres for their initial diagnostic workup. And therefore, um, the samples are there, whereas TYA patients very often get diagnosed in their local hospital. Um, so it's it's hard to get hold of them. Um, and TYA patients, for all kinds of very understandable reasons, don't want to travel. They're less involved in research trials. There's a whole there's a whole big gap in TYA. And we all recognize that because actually outcomes are less good in TYA patients. So that's one area where we're really seeking to get involved. Um, we're really helped by this, by something called the oh, I've forgotten its name now anyway. Um, the service specification. So as an NHS employee, we work to what we call service specifications, which is what we're meant to do. And the service specification for TYA cancer patients now says you should offer banking. So we're working together with the NHS to increase banking in TYA. Um, the other area, um, and I'm speaking slightly outside of my personal expertise, would be in some solid tumors where, you know, as I said earlier, solid tumors can be really small and well, the tumor is nice. The patient can be small, the tumor is small, and the biopsy can be even smaller, um, which can make it really difficult to study uh, those diseases. So some re some of the reasons that research is biased towards maybe leukemias, for example, not that I'm saying we shouldn't research leukemias, is because they're so much easier to get hold of. And that's where these streck tubes come in. So streck tubes provide us with what's called cell-free DNA, which is found in your blood, but comes from tumor cells. So you can actually study tumor DNA without having to get at the tumor. So if the tumor is an impossible to get at place, you can still learn, th learn things from it using that method. So that's why we're collecting those streck tubes in particular to really increase the ab ability to study those hard to get at um, solid tumors. So I guess those are our two big areas for expansion. Yeah, that sounds really promising. Um, I've not heard of the streck tubes. Um, yeah, a technical name. It's just they can get us. They can get us that kind of DNA. That's yeah. Um, so I have questions that aren't from me, which I'm sure you'll be excited to know. Um, so somebody would like to know whether fruit flies are an option to replace mice in the future, especially in terms of cost, and if so, would they be effective? Okay, so the technical term for fruit fly is called Drosophila, um, and lots of people study Drosophila. And uh, yes and no, we. You know, fruit flies are used uh, for research and so are other various um, organisms, uh, nematode worms, uh, zebrafish are quite commonly studied. Um, they're very good for studying biological mechanisms uh, in general. And so what a protein does, what, what something does, and there are definite analogies between what a protein does in a fruit fly and what it does in a human. But none of those models are able to, you can't do 
PDX in a Drosophila. You cannot get human cancer cells into a fruit fly and study them in that same setting. So, yes, well, I mean, look, wherever possible, um, we try to learn what we can learn without using animals, even without using fruit flies. You know, we do it in a cell line, in a laboratory, if that is possible to do so. Um, so yes, they are used, but they don't, they're not really ever going to replace that fundamental role of a PDX, which can study the actual behavior of human cells um, in, an, in a living organism. Okay, so I've got another question for you. Um, so are there opportunities to be involved in research in the clinical setting? In the clinical setting? I must admit, I'm not quite sure what the question means. If um, Rosie, if you're able to clarify, I think, please. As a clinician. I see. Okay, so I mean the the I mean the answer is yes. Let's take a look at a very broad view on this. Um, the cell bank's primary purpose is to uh, facilitate what we would technically call translational research. So translational research is the study of the cancer, how it happened, how to treat it, all those kinds of things, but outside of the actual patient. Okay, so researchers who are in laboratories who might be clinicians, but often are not clinicians themselves, they're expert scientists, and that's what translational research is for the patient for the benefit of the patient in the longer term but outside of the actual patient the other bunch of research that i'm involved in and lots of other people are involved in is clinical research where we with again with patient consent study how to best treat a patient or learn things about the patient with the actual patient um and that's where clinical trials come in um in terms of clinicians uh clinicians absolutely get involved in all of our clinical trial research and we fully recommend that and clinicians can get involved in translational research it does depend where you are and what researchers are nearby you and you know it can be easy or difficult to help facilitate translational research but if if people if if scientists nearby have got good ideas um there are definitely ways to make those happen and get involved as a clinician and, and bridge that gap because there are lots of scientists out there who need that help translating their ideas into into the patient context i hope that helps sounds good um, so i think unless anyone else have any questions um i do have a comment from somebody saying they have no questions but it was very informative and it's good to see uh, ppi being so integrated um okay. nice so uh yeah i think unless anyone else has any questions or if there's anything you want to add john no, I said to say thank you everyone for coming. Uh, and yeah, if you, I mean, get the word out. If anybody uh, knows uh, people who want to get involved in PPIE and without putting words in your mouth, if you support the idea of this, get the word out to people. I mean, this is, you know, I suppose our our dream, I don't know if it's a dream, what we, we want to be in a position where, you know, people know about this, and they understand what it's for and they actually come to their clinicians and say, uh, I would like to get involved in this. So rather than, I mean, obviously clinicians will approach them, but actually if patients come to them and go, you know what, I've got this and I know that what banking is and I'd really like, I'd really like to help uh, if they do. Um, so that's kind of one of our aims. So yeah, if people are willing, get the word out, say hopefully how useful it is. I mean, we think it's really useful, but yeah, and thank you for coming. Okay, so um, I'll put the link to the biobank in the email. So you will be um, getting an email shortly asking for feedback. Um, so please do fill it out so we can make sure that these are the best they can be. Um, thank you very much for joining us this evening. And thank you to John for your talk. Um, it has been recorded and we will be sending it out in the next few days. So um, have a lovely evening, everyone. And thank you again, John. Great. Thanks all. Thank you. Bye.